On November 25, 1869, Uriah Stevens, a local labor leader of Philadelphia, called on several of the leading members of the Garment Cutters Union to meet with him in his home. He explained his vision of a brotherhood of toil, open to every laborer or artisan who wanted to improve his mind and condition, regardless of nation, religion, or race. On that day, the noble and holy order of the Knights of Labor was established. Little did Stevens know, the Knights of Labor would grow to become one of the largest and most influential labor unions in American history. In the late 1800s, the battle between organized labor and businesses began to escalate. Organized labor was categorized by small and fractured trade unions, made up of one trade. They lacked the negotiating power to influence their conditions. The Knights of Labor, it appeared, was destined to consolidate the scattered groups. The Knights of Labor brought sweeping change to the labor movement. Their structure, inclusiveness, and swift growth gave them a strong and powerful base to improve the conditions of the worker. Between 1880 and 1890, they were the primary labor group in the country. The Knights of Labor was made up of local and district assemblies. The Knights were controlled by a general assembly headed by a grand master workman. The general assembly often had times controlling the actions of local assemblies which often had a great deal of autonomy. At its peak, the Knights had almost 12,000 local assemblies in the United States. Darius Stevens was elected as the first Grand Master Workman. He founded the Knights of Labor as a secret fraternal labor union. The group based its practices off a well-known secret society, the Freemasons. Many members of the Knights were conflicted with Stevens over the secrecy of the union. He was later replaced by Terence Powderly, who would later make the practices and name of the order public in 1882. Potterly was a charismatic and visionary leader. Under his leadership, the Knights advocated the eight-hour workday. Potterly did not support strikes. He saw them as too radical. Instead, he supported slow, calculated action based on long-term education as to the moral desirability of improved working conditions. Despite his dislike of strikes, Public opinion and rogue local assemblies often involved the Knights in strikes. The Knights of Labor were founded on the principles of equality and inclusiveness. They included both skilled and unskilled workers in the order. Perhaps their most progressive acts were including African Americans and women in the order. Grandmaster Workman Terence B. Powderly declared in 1879 that the outside color of a candidate should not debar him from admission. Rather, let the coloring of his mind and heart be the test. The Knights of Labor also saw the tactical importance of allowing blacks to be admitted. The Journal of United Labor, the official order publication, stated to any with a foolish prejudice against color that unorganized African Americans might be used as a tool to aid the employer in the grinding down of wages. In a strike against the Wabash Railroad, Jay Gould's company hired blacks as scabs in western Arkansas. They were soon organized into a Knights of Labor assembly. The Knights of Labor were very successful in getting support from African Americans on plantations. They worked to support desegregation in the assemblies in the South. Their annual General Assembly meeting in 1886 took place in Richmond, Virginia. The leaders had a black knight, Frank J. Farrell, introduce the governor of Virginia and Terence B. Powderly to the assembly. At its peak, the order was said to have about 60,000 African American members. The Knights' decision to include women in the order was very revolutionary. The Knights, in their preamble, expressed their goal to secure, for both sexes, equal pay for equal work. Mother Jones, a famous labor and women's rights activist, recruited many women into the Knights of Labor. Some women held high positions within the Knights, such as Leona Berry, who was appointed as president of the Department of Women's Work. At one point, 65,000 women members in 400 different assemblies represented almost 10% of the order. The Knights had success in several labor disputes. The greatest victory was their strike on the Wabash Railroad. The railroad was owned by Jay Gould, known to be one of the most ruthless robber barons of the time. Terence Powderly, forgoing his oppositions to strikes, ordered one on the railroad. Gould, fearing the size of the Knights' strike could destroy his company, agreed to meet with Powderly. 
After several days of arbitration, they agreed to rehire all of the striking workers and officially recognize the Knights of Labor as a legitimate labor representative. The Knights of Labor experienced the fastest and largest growth of any labor union in history. In July 1985, the Knights were compromised with less than 100,000 members. Twelve months later, they had a membership of 750,000. The drastic growth was a result of the increase in popularity of the eight-hour movement, media exposure, and victorious labor disputes. In his book, 30 Years of Labor, Powderly wrote that the rapid growth of the order was caused by extensive sensationalism in the press and the spread of the eight-hour movement. In 1884, the night strikes on the Union Pacific and Wabash Railroads were successful, which increased their popularity. Unfortunately, the Knights' prosperity did not last long. They soon experienced failures when they were tied to the radical and violent movements of labor. The Knights of Labor did not support socialists or anarchists. In his memoir, 30 Years of Labor, Carter repeatedly expressed an anxiety that so-called anarchists were able to penetrate the order so easily and wreak havoc from within. Their involvement in violent strikes led to their association with anarchists, like Emma Goldman. In 1886, workers in a Chicago company owned by Silas McCormick went on strike. The Chicago Knights of Labor took part in the walkout. On May 4, 1886, the strikers held a rally in Haymarket Square to encourage support. While leaders of the strike were giving speeches, the Chicago police came in to break up the assembly, when suddenly, a bomb exploded. The it was later determined that an anarchist threw the bomb. Several people were arrested in connection to the bombing, one of which was Albert Parsons, a member of the Knights of Labor. He was later executed along with three others. The Haymarket Riot turned public opinion against the Knights of Labor, causing a drastic loss in membership. The Knights were also involved in a strike against Homestead Steelworks, a company owned by the famous businessman Andrew Carnegie. Henry Clay Frick, Carnegie's partner, hired 300 men from the Pinkerton National Detective Agency to defend the plant from the strikers. When the Pinkertons, also known as the hired assassins of plutocracy, arrived on barges, the strikers began to shoot at them from the riverbank. After hours of siege, the Pinkertons finally surrendered. When they reached the shore, they were brutally beaten by the mob. Later, Henry Clay Frick was shot and stabbed by an anarchist assassin in his office. The extreme violence of the strike helped to aid in the drastic decrease of public opinion on the Knights of Labor. The Knights often came into conflict with the Catholic Church. The Church feared the Knights' status as a secret organization. Archbishop James Corrigan of New York led the Church's campaign against the Knights. He declared in his letter, National Pastorals of American Hierarchy, that any Catholic member of the Knights cannot receive the sacraments. In 1886, Henry George, a member of the Knights of Labor, ran for mayor of New York. He made many anti-Catholic remarks in his speeches. It is estimated that the Knights lost 180,000 Catholic members during George's campaign. The Knights also suffered from competition with rival trade unions. They lost many skilled workers to the American Federation of Labor, which was run by Samuel Gompers. Many members felt that their goals would be more easily accomplished in a trade union rather than a social labor union like the Knights of Labor. After 1886, the Knights' influence in the labor movement began to decline rapidly. Their membership dropped by 500,000 in three years. By 1900, they were virtually in existence. The Knights brought change to the labor movement. They not only wanted to improve the conditions of the laborer, but also that of the nature of man. They helped to advance social, gender, and racial equality in the workplace. Despite their short existence, their legacy lives on today. In 1955, the American Federation of Labor joined with the Congress of Industrial Organizations to form a skilled and unskilled labor union following the example first set by the Knights of Labor. Without the Knights of Labor's policies of inclusiveness, the American labor movement would not be where it is today.